All right, we will finally conclude uh, our study of Canada with Boom and Bust, Part 2. Um, the Boom and Bust, uh, well, the boom occurred in uh, Boom and Bust, Part 1. Bust, the bust, occurs at the end of Part 2. But what this uh, lecture is really about is geopolitics. During the Gilded Age, uh, uh, it was impossible to escape uh, the royal connection in Canada. <clears throat> there were statues of Queen Victoria everywhere. Uh, she was on the money, of course. Um, the newly created province of Alberta during Laurier's uh, term as prime minister was named Alberta after her beloved uh, um, prince consort, Albert, uh, who died prematurely. Uh, the second most important city in British Columbia, uh, across the water from uh, Vancouver, was named, of course, Victoria. Uh, England's, or rather Canada's, uh, English connection was inescapable. The Queen's uh, <clears throat> representative in Canada was the Governor General, um, and the two Governor Generals during Laurier's term were unfortunately uh, two imperialist adventurers, uh, very military-minded, uh, Lord Minto, and after him Lord Grey, Albert Grey, the fourth Earl Grey. Um, and they would have liked to have seen Canada's small military employed in imperial adventures uh, all over the world. Uh, Laurier uh, resisted this. Um, that guy on the right um, is uh, the, His Excellency, the Right Honorable David Lloyd Johnston. He is the current Governor General of Canada. They still have one. That connection is still there. Now, the Canadian military was almost like a, not so much an army, as sort of a, a fraternal organization like the Kiwanis or the Rotary Club. Uh, they built armories in which they had parties, um, and they had these uh, incredibly fabulous uniforms. Here they are in uh, 1898 displaying all the various uniforms. Um, Laurier was fine with that. Uh, that way the military could be um, a way to express patriotism and, and give patronage uh, to loyal um, party followers. Uh, however, these governor generals wanted that military to be used to the defense of Britain around the world. Um, the first uh, attempt to do this was uh, in 1885, a guy named General Charles Gordon, or Chinese Gordon he was known, um, and got himself uh, surrounded by uh, Muslims in Khartoum, Sudan, and there was an effort to organize uh, a rescue of him, uh, an effort that Sir John MacDonald resisted Canada being a part of, but it would not be the last time the request, a similar request would be made. Now, about the time that Laurier became Prime Minister of Canada, a guy named um, Joseph Chamberlain became the uh, Colonial Secretary in London, uh, the minister in charge of the colonies, and he organized the first Colonial Conference uh, in 1897. Uh, conveniently, this coincided with the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, a celebration of her 60th year on the throne. Curiously, um, this has only happened twice in British history, and uh, the second Diamond Jubilee, that uh, celebrating the 60th anniversary of um, Queen Elizabeth's rule, uh, it was this year, uh, in 2012, as I, as I record. Um, this conference was the conference where uh, Chamberlain and others urged greater uh, political unity in the empire, and it was this unity that Laurier resisted for Canada. Um, I like Chamberlain's monocle. I'm thinking of, uh, thinking of wearing a monocle myself. Now, soon after this colonial conference, um, uh, Chamberlain, the colonial secretary, uh, determined to solve the problem, quote-unquote, of South Africa, where two British colonies cohabitated very uneasily with two independent Dutch-speaking republics, the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Their inhabitants uh, were known to themselves as Afrikaners, uh, the sort of Dutch they speak now is called Afrikaans. It's uh, migrated away from uh, the original Dutch. Uh, but they were most commonly called Boers, B-O-E-R-S. Um, to add uh, spice, is the, that, that's the Dutch word for farmers, by the way. To add spice to this mixture, uh, gold and diamonds were present in large quantities in the Transvaal, attracting miners to South Africa. Inevitably, many of them were English-speaking and, indeed, British subjects. The Boers fearing they would be overwhelmed by immigrants, limited their political rights uh, in these, uh, these Boer states. And to resolve this and other issues of, quote, persecution, unquote, Chamberlain opted for force. Uh, and this would become known as the Boer War, uh, in which, quite frankly, Britain was a, a pretty big bully 
and their reputation internationally suffered rather badly. Uh, Canada would be involved in this. Uh, Laurier would be unable to resist his English, uh, his Anglais uh, associates urging to, to send troops, and he, he wasn't able to resist it, but he tried to limit it uh, to, uh, to the degree that he could. Now, theoretically, Canada has no foreign policy because they're a colony still at this point, but the next foreign policy uh, uh, issue of the Laurier regime was uh, an Alaska boundary dispute with the U.S. The boundary had been established by a treaty between Great Britain and the Russian Empire in 1825. Russia um, conceded the interior to Britain and secured the coast for itself. When Russia sold Alaska to the U.S., there was no change in the boundary, and no one really cared until the Klondike Gold Rush. Now, at that point, interest quickened. The Canadian government now claimed that the treaty really gave it access to the sea. The American government maintained the contrary. The matter festered for a number of years into the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, when in 1903 it was put to arbitration by six jurists of high repute, quote-unquote. Um, three of them were Canadi uh, Canadians. Uh, two were, uh, I'm sorry, three of them were Americans. Two of them were Canadians, and the sixth was a Brit who um, uh, f found in favor of the Americans. Roosevelt would not have agreed to arbitration, <coughs> excuse me, unless he knew it would be worked out to his advantage. Laurier was, was annoyed by this, that Britain would sacrifice Canadian claims to please uh, America. Britain was getting friendlier with the U.S. because they realized maybe they need some, uh, some powerful allies in this increasingly uh, dangerous world. This idea of uh, uh, Canada's uh, uh, subservience to Britain uh, could be expressed in um, a poem by, uh, by Rudyard Kipling, the Anglo-Indian poet and journalist. He wrote a poem to honor Canada entitled Our Lady of the Snows, uh, perhaps because it wasn't one of his better efforts. Uh, it would be endlessly quoted, quote, Daughter am I in my mother's house, but mistress in my own. Uh, meaning uh, we're in charge in Canada, but we're, we're a daughter in our, our mother's house, the, the greater British Empire. Increasingly, Canadians were annoyed with this daughter status. In 1908, uh, the German emperor, Wilhelm II, uh, decided to start building a big navy. This was very provocative, very alarming to the British, um, and um, uh, th th this raised the idea in Canada that, that Canada should have a powerful navy of its own. Um, and so uh, a Naval Service Act was duly passed in 1910. Uh, naval bases were established at Halifax and Esquimalt, where the Royal Navy had formerly resided, and while Canada's own ships were being built, two surplus British warships were acquired, uh, one for each coast. Now, in the opinion of the opposition, uh, and imperially-minded Canadians, this was not enough. A, a tin-pot navy, uh, one guy called it, in the eyes of the French-Canadian nationalist, uh, it was far too much. Again, this, this uh, 1910 Naval Service Act is a compromise. Okay, we'll have a navy that's transferable to Britain's admiralty, but we're going to make it small. That was Laurier's compromise. In 1911, uh, Laurier negotiated, finally, a reciprocity treaty with William Howard Taft. Um, and he called an election uh, thinking he would win in 1911, uh, but the very same thing that defeated him in uh, 1891 defeated him as well. The conservatives said, well, this reciprocity treaty is, is um, uh, the first move in annexation. Laurier is selling out Canada to the Americans, and he was soundly defeated, and he would remain for the rest of his life uh, the leader of the opposition. There was a severe depression in 1913-1914, uh, followed by World War I. Uh, in which Canada did definitely participate. Uh, here we see some Canadians uh, in Europe.